Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome. Uh, I am John Horgan, director of the Center for Science Writings here at Stevens. Uh, the Center for Science Writings is part of Cal, which is the College of Arts and Letters. We spend a lot of time in Cal arguing about what its point is. Because let's face it, engineering and science rule here at Stevens. So what can those of us in the arts and humanities do to avoid feeling marginalized? One thing that I like to do is point out what a lousy job science is doing at explaining certain things, notably our minds, which are both more familiar to us and more mysterious than anything else in the universe. Over the past few decades, scientists have invented amazingly powerful methods for probing the mind's physical substrate, the brain. These advances have aroused hopes that the mind will soon yield all of its secrets. But as the Harvard psychologist Howard Gardner has pointed out, puzzles like the mind-body problem and free will still defy conventional scientific explanation. Gardner suggests that understanding the mind may require a more literary style of investigation, like that practiced a century ago by Freud and William James. That brings me to our guest. Oliver Sacks is the modern master of literary mind science in the great tradition of Freud and James. Oliver is one of my favorite writers of any kind, fiction or nonfiction. I've read six of his books and loved them all. The Center for Science Writings has compiled a list of the 70 best science books called the Stephen 70. The list includes only one book by Oliver, the man who mistook his wife for a hat, but that's because we only allow one book per author. Oliver's work consists for the most part of case studies of individuals whose minds have been profoundly altered by autism, strokes, Tourette's, and other conditions. Like a Victorian explorer, Oliver ventures into uncharted territories and returns with tales that help us see our mundane world anew. Most mind scientists downplay or ignore the irreducible uniqueness of each individual. But Oliver never lets us forget it. He once wrote, quote, to restore the human subject at the center, the suffering, afflicted, fighting human subject, we must deepen a case history to a narrative or tale. Only then do we have a who as well as a what, a real person, a patient, in relation to disease, in relation to the physical. Elsewhere, he says, the realities of patients, the ways in which they and their brains construct their own worlds, cannot be comprehended wholly from observation of behavior, from the outside. In addition to the objective approach of the scientist, the naturalist, we must employ an intersubjective approach, too. Oliver's latest book, Musicophilia, exemplifies his hybrid approach. The book reports on what brain scans and other instruments are revealing about the neural underpinnings of music. But Oliver embeds these findings within what he calls old-fashioned observation. Above all, he writes, I have tried to listen to my patients and subjects to imagine and enter their experiences. So instead of uh, giving a lecture today, um, Oliver has agreed to have a conversation uh, with me or to allow me to uh, interview him for about uh, 40 minutes or so. And then we'll open it up to questions from all of you. Then he'll, we have copies of uh, three of his books here. Musicophilia, uh, Uncle Tungsten, a wonderful uh, memoir about his childhood fascination with chemistry and um, an anthropologist on Mars. So anyway, please uh, begin by giving Oliver a warm welcome. Okay. 
So first, I think uh, you should explain what that T-shirt is about. Um, I, I was at a Darwin exhibit in London, and this is the first tree of life which Darwin put in his 1837 notebook uh, when he was relinquishing the notion of special creation and realizing that animals and plants have evolved over hundreds of millions of years. Uh, and so this is his first tree of life. It's a great diagram. Okay, so I'd like to uh, start by giving you a chance to um, say something nasty about uh, somebody who was here a year ago, uh, Steven Pinker, uh, the Harvard psychologist and linguist. He said, and actually you quoted him in Musicophilia, that music is biologically useless. So I wonder if you could just comment on that uh, statement. Well, since you professed your admiration of William James earlier, William James said the same. Hmm. Um, and um, the, now, as it happens, I got a, a long, angry letter from Stephen Pinker. Oh, no. And, um, uh, but by that time, I had um, changed my mind a certain amount. And, um, and in fact, in the paperback of the book, uh, there is a, um, a much more moderate statement uh, about the evolution of music and Stephen's views, which, um, uh, which sort of brought peace between us. Oh, that's good. Um, because I, I am by nature a reconciler, not a, not a confronter. Mm -hmm. Well, so I wanted to ask you about the roots of music, because I guess there's a debate over whether language preceded music or, or vice versa. So you actually talk about um, a book by um, uh, Stephen, Stephen Mithin, yeah. The Singing Neanderthal, right. where he proposes that music actually came before language. Yeah, well, um, and, and well, he, he I think, um, has a notion of some form of communication which was both language and music, and that the two of them is later differentiating. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Darwin wrote a lot about music, and he felt that music had preceded language, but Herbert Spencer, his contemporary, thought that language came first. Um, um, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of evidence that they co-evolved in various ways, and that there is some overlap, some overlap in the way the brain processes both, but also profound differences. Right. Uh, so that typically when, when people are aphasic, if they lose language, they're still able to sing and enjoy music. So there's another um, theory that you mention um, that I'd never heard of by uh, Merlin Donald uh -huh. in his book. I think it's called The Origin of the Mind. Yeah. And um, I wonder if you could describe this theory. He says that culture begins with uh, mimesis and that rhythm is sort of a, the quintessential uh, mimetic uh, skill. Yeah. Um, well, um, he's written, he's a, um, he was in Canada, I think he's in Pittsburgh now. He, um, uh, in this book, he talks about the three stages of culture and mind, um, and, but he feels that for human beings, there was a very important mimetic stage of gesture and performance before language, and that this sort of operatic, mimetic, you know, in my gestures I talk, we all gestures we talk, people on cell phones gestures they talk, which shows how powerful and persistent the need, the need to gesture is. Um, and, uh, but he thought that song and rhythm and ritual and, and uh, all, all went together, and that rhythm was a, um, was an essential mimetic bond, or so that people are influenced by their rhythms at every level. I mean, when two people go for a walk, they fall into step. Um, we, we fall into rhythm naturally and, and automatically, um, in a way which other animals don't. Um, and uh, those say a, um, a child of two will keep time or dance to music he hears or imagines. Chimpanzee won't. 
So, so, so this sort of rhythm and resonance seems, seems very human. And whether it goes with so-called mirror neurons or what, we don't know. So, so Darwin and others who've talked about the evolution of music haven't pointed to uh, precedence in non-human animals. They think that music is something that arose uh, just with humans. Um, well, um, Darwin, I think, thinks it arose from the cries of animals and, uh, and sort of um, communications for sex, for territory, for hunger. Um, maybe that was... Um, um, and um, Darwin had an intense notion of, of continuity. I mean, in, in his last book on earthworms, there's a fascinating opening chapter on the psychology of earthworms. <laughs> um, oh, oh, oh. Don't tell me earthworms are complicated. Oh, well, well they, they seem very human in, in, in the description. Um, the, um, uh, and, and so the, um, there was nothing unique for him about man, although there were all sorts of things which were heightened. Um, of course, Wallace, his great contemporary, and who also discovered natural selection, um, thought very differently, and, and for Wallace, the, um, uh, the human body and the human brain uh, could be explained by evolution, but not the human mind. Mm -hmm. Wallace felt there had, had to have been a, a supernatural agency at work or infusion, <coughs> and Darwin was upset and said, you are, you are murdering our baby. <laughs> well, I, uh, not to harp in this, but I, what about bird song? And, you know, some of the... the the animal behavior that we think of as uh, musical. Um, well, in fact, in the paperback of the book, which which is uh, a lot longer than the hardback, I sort of retracted, and I've um, um, because many people asked me just this question, mm -hmm. and they sent me tapes about birdsong and also about a cockatoo, a self-requested cockatoo, which which apparently danced in, in rhythm. Yes. And. Um, uh, and so I have had to retrench somewhat there. I mean, generally now, there's a wonderful book called, called Alex, Alex and Me about, about a gray parrot. You know, people used to speak of bird brains derisively, but you know, with, their, with their few grams of brains, birds do as well as we do with two kilos. <laughs> one and a half kilos. Um, we actually have... Uh, I'm sorry, but, um, but bird song is relatively fixed mm. in the formulae. Mm. Relatively, yeah. Um, and uh, whereas I think our music, like our language, in a Chomskyan way, can sort of, you know, go in different directions. Yeah. Um, I just have to tell you, we, we have a, an African grey in my home, and um, he, whenever we put on, it's not any music, but Motown, Motown with a real beat, he goes, he <laughs> bobs his head up and down uh, with the music. Now he might. We are often bobbing our heads up and down as well, so maybe he's just mimicking us. Um, yeah, well, well, this had to be looked at with the cockatoo, and, and visual cues had to be carefully excluded. But when they were excluded, it, it was clear that, that the cockatoo was responding to the rhythm of the music, synchronized with it in a, in a way which, um, well, apparently only songbirds and human beings, I mean, it may be the same with whales, but not easy to investigate. <laughs> so, um, you have all these examples in your book of uh, the therapeutic power of music to sort of integrate uh, broken people. I wonder if you can talk, for example, about um, some of the patients that you described in your book, Awakenings, and how music therapy worked for them. Um, well, um, um, more than 40 years ago, I went to a hospital in the Bronx, uh, a chronic disease hospital, and when I went through the door, I saw dozens of strange, motionless figures, some of them sort of frozen in, in odd postures. I'd never seen anything like this, and I learned that these people had all had the epidemic sleepy sickness, um, uh, which, which was epidemic in the 1920s. The hospital was open for these first victims. In, um, uh, at that time, there was no medical or surgical approach which was of any use to these patients. But the nurse and others told me, and I, I at first didn't know whether, you know, how alive they were, if, if, if they had an inside. Um, but 
And the nurses told me that they responded to music often in the most amazing way. And that I saw this myself how some of these people who were unable to take a step or utter a syllable, who couldn't initiate any flow, could in fact get go and flow immediately from music and were immediately animated. <coughs> um, uh, I once took the poet W. H. Auden to, to see this and he uh, he quoted an aphorism of Novalis, which was, every disease is a musical problem, every cure is a musical solution. Um, I, th this, uh, I mean, I think this is only metaphorically true, but it's almost literally true with these Parkinsonian patients. And, um, and I think this is partly because of this human uh, ability to synchronize with the beat so that rhythmical music and the tempo of music would give them its own rhythm. And again, in Parkinson's, if you're not frozen, you tend to do things too fast or too slow. Um, but but uh, if a Parkinsonian person sings, you can only sing in tempo. It's very difficult to sing too fast and too slow. You know, when, when Galileo was timing uh, the descent of objects down inclined planes, um, there was no chronometer as accurate for him as singing a tune and, and timing it by doing that. And so, um, so there's this sort of almost magic power of music with Parkinson's. And although I have mixed feelings about iPods, um, <laughs> an iPod can be very, very useful for someone with Parkinson's, although it may need to have some device for turning itself on. Because of course, you know, um, if you're frozen, you may be unable to turn on what you need. So, um, and then separately, as I said earlier, I saw a lot of um, people with aphasia who'd lost the power to use language, but they could sing and sometimes recapture the words of songs. And, and this in itself was often a, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, facing, I'm, I'm aware of the people. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, uh, this, uh, so whenever I see an aphasic patient, whether it's their birthday or not, I start singing happy birthday. Uh, and um, the patient first wonders, you know, what's this crazy doctor doing? And then they find themselves joining in and getting the words and being amazed because they think that they have lost words. And this may show that they still have words, even though the words may be embedded in the music. And, and, and then there's a, a challenge as to whether language can be disembedded from this sort of automatic use of the music and restore this independent function. So that fascinated me. And then, of course, I saw and continue to see a lot of people with, uh, with dementia, people who used to be called senile and now have Alzheimer's disease. Um, but even when language and memory and so much, even with people who have no explicit memories of their lives anymore, of what they did and, and of, of other people, they will, they will always remember music they've heard. And the music will carry emotion and, and memory with it and, and, and animate them. And, and so music is tremendously important, I think, for people with, with dementia or amnesia. And, you know, and, and a lot of us, depression, schizophrenia, you name it. Um, I, I, I think there's a great healing power in music. I wonder, just because it's one of my favorite um, case studies of yours, I wonder if you could uh, just describe the last hippie and, and especially the final scene where you go to uh, the concert. Oh, yeah. Um, um, uh, this was a, uh, a young man at, whom I met at Beth Abraham in 1975. Um, he had been um, uh, um, very much engaged with flower power and, and hippiedom in the 1960s, and he joined the, I don't know how much of a story to tell, he joined the Hare Krishna. Um, you know, William James, to come back to your favorite, once said that the best cure for dipsomania is religiomania. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, and um, Greg dealt with a certain drug problem um, 
uh, and a lot of sort of dry leaves found their way down to the Hare Krishna place on Second Avenue and where they got into religion. And uh, um, do I call him Greg or Gary? I, uh, I think Greg. Greg, okay, yeah. well, his real name is Gary. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Greg um, um, got very much into this and, and um, uh, changed somewhat the, um, the, he was in their temple in Brooklyn and they felt he was sort of, um, uh, that he was getting to a higher level of insight. Um, but the higher level of insight turned out to be a brain tumor. And, um, that says a lot about the 60s right there. <laughs> um, I, uh, and um, anyhow, the brain tumor was taken out, but uh, Greg was left very uneasy indeed. Um, and he, um, he had no memories after 1970 or so. Um, he loved the Grateful Dead, he would keep speaking of, of Pigpen, for example, as, as alive and well, although Pigpen was no longer alive and well. Anyhow, one day, um, in a rather unprofessional way, um, and with help, I kidnapped Grave and took him out of the hospital and took him to a Grateful Dead concert. And. Um, in the first half of the concert, they played earlier music, which he knew and loved, and joined in with great enthusiasm. In the second half, they played music which had been composed in later years, and Greg was amazed at this, because he was very musical, and he said, it's like the music of the future. It's like the music these people, he said, he, you know, he could imagine they might have written music like this sometime in the future, and yet he was hearing it now. He was very, very bewildered. Um, on the way back, he, um, he was sort of singing all of the things, but the next morning, he, 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 didn't, he had no memory of having been to the concert, though he did have some memory of the music, including what he called the music of the future. And, uh, but, um, he was a very, very sweet man. Well, what I remember also at the very end is that you were you were part of it too. You were pulled into uh, this. Even though I I assume you're not a Grateful Dead fan, but you got you got caught up in the moment as well. And it was just sort of an example of this powerful, integrative, yeah, social um, yeah, power. Yeah, the, the and rhythm, rhythm. Right. Yeah. No. No. I. I. I, I um, rather shy by nature, despite sort of being a bit of a hand now. But, but <laughs> I, I was dancing on stage and a wonderful abandon and, and it was a, um, it was sort of a, a marvelous feeling of liberation. Um, so I have a, a question actually that came from the aesthetics class taught by uh, Lisa Dolling, the uh, <laughs> philosophy professor you just uh, met a little while ago. And this has to do with savants. Uh, so, uh, Lisa's class wondered, so you describe a number of savants who also have some kind of deficit, uh, whether it's uh, Williams uh, syndrome or autism, and the question was, are any of th this particular type of savant, or any of them, would you say, genuine creative geniuses, or is it just kind of a mimetic power that they have? Um. Well, uh, first, I, I think almost by definition, all savants, the original, uh, not offensive name, was idiot savants, um, um, uh, all, all of them tend to have difficulties with, um, with abstract thought and language, and many of them are, are autistic. Um, now, their um, mimetic and a memorial and reproductive capacity can be absolutely amazing with, um, for example, with Stephen Wilshire, whom I've written about. Um, from the age of six, Stephen could just take a casual glance at a, at a, at a very complex building, um, uh, possibly like some of these intriguing 19th century buildings you have outside, and, no, and, and then draw them. Uh, very accurately. Um, once when I was with him, uh, 
we were in a shopping arcade in Moscow, sort of hung with shop signs in, in Cyrillic, uh, and uh, he, he was able to reproduce the entire arcade with all the shop signs correctly. Um, uh, Stephen, at 32, is, has, is as prodigious but also as limited as he was when he was six or eight. Um, I don't think he has been truly creative, although he's hugely talented. But a man called Darrell Treffert, um, who has written some, who has studied this more than anyone else, is convinced that at least some people, um, uh, some savants, can be creative. Certainly among the musical savants I met, you find often great abilities to improvise and play play with a tune uh, and to, to get the structure and pollute it all sorts of different ways. You know, uh, Coleridge once distinguished what he called fancy from imagination, but you can have fancy in a very high degree. Um, whether, whether anything truly novel and radical can come out is, is not, not clear. Mm. Um, although I, I think it certainly can be people who have so-called Asperger syndrome, which you know, they're not savants, and I think sort of Cavendish, the, you know, the great 18th century scientist who, who um, uh, discovered hydrogen and weighed the earth and did all sorts of wonderful things, I mean, by description, he, he had Asperger's. So the other question from uh, Lisa's class is um, whether you think um, creative genius is always associated with some type of affliction and and suffering. And I have a that's a question I have even about some scientists whether there is such a thing as just sort of a purely joyful, exuberant type of creativity, or whether there's always some sort of dark side associated with it. Um, oh. Well. Um, um, question of the 18th century sort of great wits to madness near allied. Goethe and Schiller thought very differently here. Uh, Schiller was convinced that there was a dark side and often a, a great sense of loss and a need for compensation. Goethe thought in terms of some primary exuberance. Um, I don't see these as, as incompatible. Um, uh, but I, um, Kay Redfield Jameson has written a um, uh, fascinating book in which artists' life histories and particularly what seem to be their manic and depressive cycles are, are apparently correlated with their, with their creativity. I, I think she goes a little too far there. Um, and, and in any case, she does not extend this to, to scientists. You know, they will be a supposedly sort of more more stable. Um, <laughs> but we all know what the truth is. Yeah. Um, it's um, well, I mean, the scientists have their their matches and their fantasies and their dreams as as much as anyone. And I don't think there is any such thing as cold blooded science. I think uh, I think scientific insight and imagination is as passionate as any other. Although then then you have to have some rather sober sort of critiquing and filtering going on. Um, I, I don't think there is necessarily a dark side to creative genius. I think there often is, but I, but I think when the genius is in full flow, this is just the mind and brain at its, at its wonderful best. And, uh, and I think it's an intrinsically sort of happy state. And although one can be deeply unhappy when, when it stops, or, 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 or when it's not bad. So there was um, <clears throat> a remarkable episode that you, you uh, well, many remarkable episodes, but uh, there was a dream that you described that you had in uh, Musicophilia in 1974 uh, involving German music. You heard it in the dream and then it continued after you yeah. uh, awoke. Um, I wonder if you could describe that. Uh, I, I probably shouldn't have put that in the book. <laughs> um, well, this has been a, um, a difficult time. 
Um, and I was very insomniac at that time, and taking a great deal of a now um, uh, um, old-fashioned hypnotic called chlorhydrate. Um, if any of you have read old detective stories, a Mickey Finn consists of chlorhydrate and alcohol. And I gradually be increasing the dose, and this had the effect of producing particularly vivid, tenacious dreams, which sometimes continued uh, into the daytime, especially musical dreams. Um, some of the musical dreams I, I enjoyed, there was sort of a, a lot of Mozart. Um, but there was one night I, uh, I awoke, and there was some very unpleasant, I found very unpleasant songs going on, and I couldn't stop them. And I had a shower, I sort of slapped my face, and I, I had a cup of coffee, and finally in desperation, I phoned up a friend and, um, and complained of this. I said, there are these, these uh, I said, there's music going through my head. He said, what sort of music? And I said, well, they're songs, and they're, they're in German, and I, I don't understand German. And he said, well, could I hum some of these songs? And I did so. And then there was a pause, and he said, Oliver, have you deserted some of your young patients, or have you destroyed some of your literary children? And I said, both, yesterday. How did you guess? And he said, these are marvelous kinder token leader, his songs of mourning for the death of children. And then I admitted that I had a crisis the day before, when I flung out in anger from a, a pediatric ward where I had been working, and then in a guilty state through a manuscript of a book I had been writing in the fire. And uh, so that particular, um, I, mean, I think with musical hallucinations, which, which are a central part of my musical book, as visual hallucinations will be a central part of a comic book, uh, they're both, um, um, <coughs> I don't think you can, there, there may be fairly clear neurological correlates of hallucination, but I think there also have to be all sorts of psychic determinants. I mean, there cannot not be, because we are individuals. Um, and, uh, but there, I, um, I was amazed at my cunning, crooked consciousness, <laughs> sort, of, sort of seeking down, and in another language, I hate Mark. Eaten, um, but not as much as Wagner. <laughs> you know, um, but coming up with the very thing which, which gave the clue. Incidentally, as soon as this interpretation was given, the songs disappeared. And I'm, uh, I'm a great believer in the power of correct interpretation, sometimes in the right way and at the right moment, which is why I'm just entering my 44th year as an analyzant. <laughs> well, I mean, we were just getting, getting, getting to it. <laughs> well, so the reason I, I seized on that little story is it's so Freudian. I mean, so it obviously uh, indicates that there's something un unconscious going on, and the unconscious is kind of giving you this symbol of something that you just went through uh, that is causing you some stress. So that was my segue to Freud and to ask you what kind of influence Freud has been on your work, either literary or scientific. What parts of Freud uh, do you think are worth preserving? Which parts do you think we can let go? Big, big question. Big question. Um, well, first, um, in terms of um, literally, um, if that's the right word, um, I love um, Freud's case histories, which I go back to again and again, especially the early ones, the studies in hysteria. Now, Freud himself said rather apologetically that these case histories might read like novels or like fiction. And th this was not his intention, but that in fact, the material demanded this. Um, uh, someone who was also a great influence on me was Luria, the Russian neuropsychologist. And when I read a book of his called The Mind of an Eminence in 1968, I read the first 30 pages thinking it was a novel. And then I realized it was a case history, but the most detailed 
his history, and then the Jewish name, I gave away, but with all the, the style and the sensibility and the pathos and the drama of a novel. And so um, Freud, for me, has been a, a great teacher of case history and narrative. Um, now, I, I have no pretensions to being a theoretician. I am very much, um, uh, I, I keep very close to experience and, and description, although, although it would be disingenuous to say that you can't. I mean, Darwin himself said no one, no one could be a good observer unless they were an active theorist. Um, uh, I, um, uh, um, I think a lot of Freud will, has gone overboard, will go overboard, like the death instinct, which he, which he never sort of was too keen on himself. I mean, he, he himself was very happy to discard many earlier things. And late Freud, I think, is very much unlike early Freud. Um, but I think there are, um, I think the notion of a dynamic unconscious, of repression, of dissociation, um, uh, you know, was, uh, are finding neurological correlates. Um, I, um, I don't know what, what to, to do about his notion of, of ego in, in id and superego, although or, 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 or the frontal lobes are often, often rather behave rather like a, a superego function, and one, one needs a holiday from them every so often. Um, but um, in 1897, Freud wrote a sort of project in which he tried to embed psychology in neurology. Um, he never published it, and, uh, but it was published after his death. But obviously, sort of um, at that time, you know, um, you know, uh, nerve cells had only just been described. We really had no idea of how the brain was put together, or very little idea. Um, but I think now, as Eric Kandel does, that there will certainly be a rapprochement between, between many aspects of Freud and neuroscience, although I'm, I'm, I'm not up to be more specific. What about the whole, I mean, it seems to me that there are these um, two sort of polar opposite attitudes in uh, brain and mind science right now. So you've got, on the one hand, some scientists, I. You know Edelman well, maybe you can tell me if this is correct, who are optimistic that we can actually have a kind of unified neural theory of the brain and mind and sort of solve the, the mind-body problem. On the other hand, you've got the Mysterians, right, right. who are saying that uh, the, there's something unique about the mind as a scientific problem that means that we will never really understand it entirely. Um, well, um, uh, um, 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 Edelman tends to say that um, neuroscience, compared to the reality of mind, is like a menu compared to a meal. Uh, and that um, one may uh, find the neural cause of red or pain, uh, but um, uh, but perhaps you can't you know, go any further than that. Um, uh, um, a few years ago, people never used a, a term like consciousness. Um, now I think there are those who feel that there is something beyond an insuperable problem, what Colin McGinn called, calls a mystery. Um, there are others who feel that it is a difficult problem, but one which we will solve in 20 or 30 years. I think Adolin partly comes there, and certainly he feels if we can't solve it, we may be able to simulate it. And so he is very keen on developing, using another Jamesian word, what he calls his noetic automata, um, uh, which um, uh, are not robots, are not given instructions or programs, but which um, they have, they given sense organs and they given certain values, for example, like light is better than dark, or red is better than blue. And given this, they will then construct a world of their own 
and in a way which, which even their master, their Frankenstein, can't predict. Um, uh, the robots are called Darwin's, uh, actually the automata are called Darwin's. He's out to about Darwin 9. Um, I think he regards the rest of us as about Darwin 30. Um, but he feels that maybe 20 years or so we will have, we will have simple conscious automata. Um, I bet it still can't clean his house. Um, um, probably not. I mean, this business of consciousness, um, I mean, it, it seems to emerge. Um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, one uses consciousness in so, so many different ways. And as I say, um, um, uh, Darwin regards earthworms as, as, as conscious in a way. And you know, it's certainly sort of, there must be some sort of inner life and pain and this and that. Uh, I, I would think even, even in sort of microorganisms. But, um, but certainly, uh, everything from reptiles and higher um, uh, are able to make complex scenes and predictions and to map reality and uh, consciousness seems to emerge in the most natural way from nervous systems and to be embodied in them. But there is no analogy anywhere else in nature. So we can't form a metaphor. And Colin McGinn would um, uh, talks about, I think, conceptual closure here, that um, we, we cannot form any concept uh, which, which is adequate to deal with consciousness. And, um, I, um, uh, I sort of agree and disagree with, with both of them. I would think um, that... I, I would also say that I got sick of the problem of consciousness, and I got so tired of reading books on consciousness that I went back to to botany, which is a, which is a favorite science, so the, you know, plants aren't bothered with consciousness. <laughs> Bless them. Uh, well, as far as we know. Right. Um, well, they, um, uh, um, they, um, they, they do have senses, senses and reactions. Uh, um, insectivorous plants are wonderful. Um, in fact, um, um, Darwin once said of the sun, you know, insectivorous plants, he said, it's not only really a wonderful plant, but a most sagacious animal. <laughs> but, but that was going a bit too far. So I wanted to ask you about, um, before we open it up to questions, um, another big question, I'm sorry. Uh, psychiatry, the state of modern psychiatry. You know, you had a brother who was... Uh, uh, Schizophrenic. Schizophrenic, struggled with mental illness, and um, I know you've been, you know, you wrote a long essay recently about uh, mental illness as opposed to neurological uh, conditions. I just wonder if, what your thoughts are about that, and if you could also address the, the issue of sort of the, the influence of the pharmaceutical industry on uh, psychiatry. Um, well, let me start okay. with, with that. Um, um, prior to the 1950s, there were no drugs which were considered specific for psychosis or mania. Uh, people were given sedatives, they were given barbiturates or bromides or chlor, peraldehyde, you know, which was sort of damp them down generally. Um, when um, uh, Thorazine and other drugs came in in the early 50s, it was at first imagined that these might target um, the psychosis, or as it were, the psychosis producing parts of the brain, as these were imagined to be precisely, and so sort of relieve someone of psychosis. And, um, and this went along with a general move to deinstitutionalize patients, and thought to sort of get them out of the asylums, medicate them, restore them to society. None of that has worked too well and uh, especially in New York City. Um, the, um, the early antipsychotics were dirty in the sense of often having many unwanted side effects, um, but, they, um, uh, but they could also damp down emotion and imagination generally, and, and many people did not want them. And again, um, one may want one's own psychosis. I know that my schizophrenic brother once said that he wished, that he knew psychoses were dangerous, and he wished he could, he wished he could have been 
physically constrained, but not chemically leucotomized, not chemically lobotomized. But he said that for, he thought that for him, his uh, what his psychosis, whatever was going on in the brain chemically, was also a search for value and meaning, and for trying to reorganize the world. And that if he'd been permitted to do that, perhaps he would have come out of the psychosis sort of clearer. And there's some evidence that this can sometimes be true. Um, I think um, now there are now much cleaner drugs, but I think it is clear to everyone that drugs alone are not enough. And I've been especially interested in, in therapeutic communities of one sort or another. I was recently at a fascinating um, community um, in North Carolina, um, which, com which although it uses drugs and psychotherapy, uh, um, as much, but no more than is needed. It also provides work, companionship, fresh air, diet, music, and, and, and everything to make a life. And um, so I, um, and these things are not marginal. I mean, um, the sort of work, I mean, you know, um, Freud saw the great healing things as work and love. And work and love act on the brain. Everything acts on the brain. If anything is effective, it's all through the brain, whether it's conversation or work or love or drugs or music. So I think we, um, 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 although in a way, sort of drugs are cheap, one, one needs a total existential approach. And, uh, and, and one aims at the individual and not at the not just the, the, the disease, if, if indeed disease is an appropriate term. Yeah. Well, thanks. Um, I bet some people out there have questions. So let's, uh, let's open it up. Susan? Since you were just talking about therapeutic communities, I thought that the ideas of Ronald Lang are sort of de classe now. Are you saying that he was onto something? Did everybody hear that? No? Oh, um, Susan asked about the, uh, the ideas of uh, R.D. Lang, uh, who is a British psychiatrist who had um, proposed some of these community-type uh, treatments for mental illness. Particularly schizophrenia. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that um, there's a common thought that the early R.D. Lang was fascinating and important but that he went overboard himself yeah. later. Um, and similarly with Thomas Sass and the myth of mental illness. Um, uh, and Thomas Sass's career was very much hurt when in a way through his, what was regarded by the courts of negligence, a, a schizophrenic patient of his, I think, committed suicide. Um, schizophrenia is very real and can be very dangerous carry a high suicide rate. Um, so, um, I, I mean, there's a danger of overreaction in both ways of going all to medication and not, and not what's going on with the person or, or to deal entirely in sort of terms of, of meaning and community. You've got to have both. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the what kinds of music are more or less useful in what ways? I mean, so do the patients who are frozen bop more to like Nirvana than to say Enya? <laughs> um, the question was, what kinds of music work best for therapy and the relative merits of Nirvana versus Enya? <laughs> Do you know who those are? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nirvana was a 90s grunge band, and actually the uh, lead singer committed suicide. Enya is more kind of a new age, fair to say, new right. agey. Something energetic versus something calm. Yeah. Uh, energetic versus calm. Um, well, I am, um, well, uh, those terms are similar terms were in fact used by the, the Greeks 
um, who recognized many different modes of music, sort of Phrygian and Bixolydian and so forth, some energetic and some calm. Um, I'm sorry I didn't know those terms, but my own musical education taste sort of finished about 1950. <laughs> um, in fact, really in about 1890. <laughs> um, the, um, um, with the Parkinsonian patients, one can be specific and say that there must be a, a strong but not overwhelming beat uh, because it is particularly synchronization to beat and use of a beat, which is important. Um, Nietzsche once wrote of Wagner uh, that Wagner represented, quote, the pathological in music. And the pathological for him was, quote, degeneration of the sense of rhythm, an endless melody. Tristan. Tristan is not good for Parkinson's. Um, no, um, it's not. It's not. Um, crucial for the Parkinsonian that the music be either likable or familiar, although if it's both, that's a bonus. Um, um, for people with Alzheimer's, um, where you are calling on memory and emotion, you have to have music which is evocative and which calls on memory and emotion, so music which is familiar and, uh, and associated with, with feeling, and so that's that's different. Um, the, now, most of the patients I dealt with, I work mostly in old age homes, people who are even older than I am, and uh, so uh, they would have an even less idea of what Nirvana and Enya, uh, Enya um, <laughs> are. But I, um, uh, but I, I would imagine that the same Considerations, both neural considerations and therapeutic, sort of, sort of apply. And, um, and um, uh, incidentally, Mickey Hart, the drummer, has has drum circles everywhere, and, and that can be very, very powerful. Um, but, um, uh, but, but obviously, when one needs one needs calm music as well. Yes, have you uh, noticed any? Um, correlation or insight into a person's age and the kind of music that they like at various ages, childhood, youth, adolescence, so on, and uh, the kinds of problems that you've been working with. Evolution of uh, taste of taste as people, and I know I'm still locked into the music of the 60s, it hasn't changed for that, me. That's what I mean. Uh, <laughs> very often an adolescent has a certain love for certain kinds of music, yeah. childhood may be different. Is there anything that you've studied along those lines? Yeah. No, well, well, you know, I, I, I haven't really studied this. I, I mean, as, as a neurologist, I've been concerned either with musical problems you know, like people, for example, who follow the stroke may be unable to recognize music or, or not react to it emotionally or, or whatever. And, uh, and, 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 and music, music therapy, I, I don't know enough about the, uh, sort of the normal stages. Um, uh, in general, I think people do tend to get locked into their earlier tastes. I, I, I um, admit this possibly with shame, I don't know. Um, I, um, you know, I, I grew up in a house full of, full of classical music. I was not exposed to popular music or jazz. And, uh, and, 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 I, and I have not been adventurous. Um, although now actually I've been um, approached by a, a remarkable bassoonist, um, uh, Dan Smith, a bassoonist, who, who actually came and paid me a visit with, with his bassoon, and um, I, I may be altering. Um, the, when people have musical hallucinations, which are, can be especially associated with deafness, uh, the hallucinations are nearly always of music they were exposed to early in life. They may not necessarily have attended or liked it. I mean, it tends to be popular music and hymns. Um, but uh, um, but hopefully 
there are many people who are much more adventurous than I am and sort of, um, uh, and sort of, uh, you know, always excited by the latest. But can you, can you describe, though, the, uh, the incident that's right at the beginning of your book where the man is struck by lightning and he suddenly develops this overwhelming passion for classical music? Yeah. Um, well, this is a, uh, a surgeon in upstate New York. Um, uh, uh, a very robust man, former football player, um, uh, um, not really musical. He had a few piano lessons as a child. He didn't get in the way, and he had no taste or talent, and uh, never had a piano in the house. And in '94, he was. Um, this was just really before cell phones came in. He was on an outdoor phone, speaking to his mother. There was a storm in the distance. And then suddenly the swarm was on him, and a bolt of lightning hit him, flew out of the phone, hit him in the face, threw him back several yards, and it even killed him. Uh, that's to say, it, it gave him ventricular fibrillation, and his heart stopped. He then had a strange episode, which he puts a mystical interpretation on, in which he seemed to be floating above the ground and looking down and seeing his own inert body being resuscitated. Um, uh, he also had some ecstatic visions of, of him and whatnot. Um, anyhow, he was resuscitated um, somewhat to his annoyance. <laughs> um, and, and then appeared to be pretty much himself. He had some memory problems for a week or so, but then, then these disappeared. He returned to work. But then three weeks later, something very strange started happening. And in the course of the weekend, he first developed what he called an insatiable passion uh, for classical music and for Chopin in particular, and bought many CDs. Um, he then wanted to play what he was hearing, although he couldn't read music. Uh, and he then wanted to compose. And, um, so, and he, he was taken over by music. Um, and, um, and this lasted. Um, he continued to work as a surgeon, but he would start getting up at three or four in the morning. He got a music teacher. He learned how to notate music. Um, um, uh, music started to come to him. He felt he had a sort of telephone line to heaven. There was a certain... Um, uh, grandiose feeling. He felt that um, uh, God had provided a lightning stroke, but also the person who resuscitated him, also the particular neural changes um, which made him a musician and was now his mission to bring music to the world. And indeed, he does this. He is a very respectable performer. Um, he has uh, composed several pieces, one of the most recent, recent of which is his Lightning Sonata. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, 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 the acquisition of language is very critical. If one's not exposed to speech or sign language by the age of five or so, one will never have competent language. There doesn't seem to be this critical quality with music, and even without being struck by lightning, um, uh, especially now in the paperback of the book, I added stories of people apparently becoming musical in, in middle life. Um, uh, one interesting one, um, you mentioned Stephen Mithen, who wrote a book called The Singing Neanderthal. Mithen describes how he himself, as a boy, was asked to sing in front of a class, was ridiculed, was humiliated, was told he couldn't sing, he was tone deaf that he was not musical. He accepted all of this, he said, uh, and avoided music for the next 30 years. And then in 06, he started, uh, sorry, in 07, he started on an experiment. He decided to take a year of singing lessons and to go through with it, however, whether he liked it or not, whether he did well or not, and to get functional brain imagery before and after. To everyone's surprise, especially his own, he enjoyed the singing lessons, he became rather good, he joined a choir, and if you look at, at the, an issue of the New Scientist for earlier this year, 
you can compare for yourself what the brain, the, the activation of the brain before and afterwards. So this, in fact, is a very beautiful sort of personal and neuroscientific story of someone who had been inhibited musically, and but had then really acquired musicality as an adult. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's an important story. Because I, I think a lot of us have been, been told, you can't draw, you can't sing, you can't write, and, um, and, and, and carry this sort of internal accusation with us for decades. I really can't sing. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. Well, you suddenly developed a talent. So just to re so she said at the age of uh, eleven or twelve she suddenly developed a, a passion for music. Oh. Let me try to summarize that. I think she's talking about, if, if, if I'm right, these cases of extraordinary memory of some musicians where they're playing a very long, complicated uh, piece, maybe 30 or 40 minutes long. And, and in some cases, if they are, it sort of all comes in a block. And if they're interrupted, right. then. Um, uh, let me give you an analogy. I was um, uh, in a restaurant and um, uh, the waiter brought out a long list of specials. And um, I, uh, I thought I heard a particular tuna thing and I asked him about the tuna and he looked bewildered and produced the entire list again. <laughs> um, so he only had the list on lock. Um, but um, I, I think it's um, where there's organic continuity with poetry or music, um, it, it has to be remembered partly in time. And um, although there'll be thematic things, but a conductor, for example, say, you know, go back to bar 110 or something, because a new theme has started then. Um, but there are many sorts of memory of music. There are sort of explicit memories, but there are also programmatic or motor memories. And uh, I, it may be in the paperback, for example, I was given one history, uh, one story um, uh, by a colleague who was a, um, uh, a jazz pianist. Um, when he was younger, and he described how at one session he got extremely drunk and really been unconscious for most of the time, and then he came to at one point and saw, uh, saw that his hands were moving fluently on the piano. At that point, he stumbled. <laughs> then, mercifully, he lost consciousness again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and continued fluently. But, but in general, um, um, when one has a piece of poetry or music um, rather clearly in the hands, it's, um, it's often not good to, to think exactly what you're doing. And, you know, and, and athletes and ball players will, will also say that. You have to think intensely to acquire it in the first place, perhaps, and to think of the structure of the music and the different voices, whatever. But, but once it's in you, 
it's, uh, it's very much a lower level and subcortex and cerebellum. And, um, and on the whole, they know what they're doing. <laughs> and they do it. Yeah, Dave. So he's asking about stories in which people dream or hallucinate a song, a real song that they supposedly have never heard before. He's asking if that was the case with you or if you had been exposed to this. Um, no, no, no. I, I, much as I dislike Marla, I, I certainly been exposed to it. Um, but um, I think that the fact that people have hallucinated Again, to come back to William James, or, or I think he mentions in his Principles of Psychology a, um, uh, a, um, a maid servant, uh, to use the old fashioned term, who, um, uh, who became delirious and in her delirium um, recited volumes and volumes of Greek poetry. Uh, but it turned out that the professor who she had worked for was a professor of Greek and he used to recite the Iliad aloud and, and she had just sort of taken it in. Um, but um, to be more specific, um, the, um, uh, sometimes people will hear a song or write a story or something thinking it is their own and um, I think that one of the Beatles did this, and then it turned out that this was um, something uh, which someone else had written, and uh, and a sort of lawsuit came up for plagiarism. But there could be unconscious plagiarism or cryptamnesia, so called, in which you think you are hearing or dreaming or inventing something for the first time, but in fact you 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 have you have heard it in the past. So. What are the musicians at the back? Among your discussions today has been about the mental stimulation with like the Parkinson's patient that heard a beat in the left. I was wondering in any of your travels, the difference between um, the natural production of music, like the deaf person who can touch the piano and feel the music, and then participate that way. Have you seen that in any of the specific illnesses where the the different therapeutic powers of uh, actually producing music, playing a piano, for example, as opposed to just listening to oh, music. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think this is much stronger. Um, I got one an interesting letter from a man with a bipolar manic depressive disorder who felt that he could alter his mood by playing music, but not by listening to music. And um, the, I, I think play, playing music is always, is always more powerful if that's possible. Uh, the other musician. Uh, I'm wondering, you spoke a lot about the correlation between rhythm and the therapy pieces um, in your practice. Are there other elements of music that you've noticed correlations of, for example, pitch class? What was, what was that term? Pitch? Pitch? Okay. Um, I heard this as Hitchcock. Yeah, I, I, it's not a, it's a unfamiliar term to me too. So um, the therapeutic power of rhythm as opposed to pitch or melody maybe? Or harmony. Harmony. Uh, Yeah. Like the Adagio of the Strings by Barber. It has this very sweeping intensity that's basically caused by a rise in pitch. 
adagio for strings, rising yeah. pitch. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, I think, all, you know, um, I won't say all, but, but, but the, the emotional and evocative power of music uh, um, obviously goes with, with the with the melody and the harmony and the, the richness of modulation and um, but um, and, I, and I don't even know that there is any, any, any pure rhythm as such although rhythm is always an element but uh, actually I want to ask you a question that um, I'm sorry, I said something is uh, um, just going back to the previous thing um, a nice example comes to me um, when Helen Keller uh, was 11 years old, she wrote a short story. And people were amazed, this deaf-blind girl writing, writing a short story, and it, it seemed very good, and it was published. And it then turned out that the story was a very close indeed, sometimes a verbatim reproduction, and other times a paraphrase, um, of a children's story which had been written five years earlier. Um, admiration turned to accusation uh, with Helen Keller, and she said, I thought I invented it. I've never heard of this. I don't know. Anyhow, it turned out that this story was read to her or tapped into her hands when she was seven. Now, many people came to her defense, including the original author of the story, who said that she was amazed at the powers of memory of, a, of this little girl, and also that the story had been improved <laughs> by Helen Keller, and also by Mark Twain, uh, who said of himself, he did this all the while. And Mark Twain um, uh, described how, um, when he um, published one of his books, a friend said, I always liked that epigraph. <laughs> he said, what do you mean you always liked it? And um, uh, then it turned out that the epigraph was, in fact, an Oliver Wendell Holmes collected poems. And Mark Twain wrote apologetically, um, saying that two years earlier he'd forgotten this, he'd been reading a lot of poems, and somehow the epigraph must have been on top. And Oliver Wendell Holmes said, don't worry, I do it all the while. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, and in fact, much of culture must be based on unconscious borrowing call it play US if, if you want, or um, uh, in which one experiences as coming from oneself an original and new and unprecedented some, something one has encountered. Yeah, actually, I, I'll just, um, I, I don't want to forget to uh, ask you this one question. You know, you said that you're not somebody who theorizes much, you prefer observation. You had, um, a section in your book where I thought you proposed a, uh, a kind of theory of everything based on rhythm. It was sort of borrowing from uh, Merlin, yeah. uh, Merlin Donald. Um, and I wonder if you could just sort of elaborate on this. So the idea of rhythm as something that can bind us socially, rhythm can bind the broken parts of a self as uh, music therapy, and also rhythm, these synchronous oscillations that Francis Crick and some other neuroscientists have said, bind different processes in our brain together into a unified self. Right. Um, the, um, things that fire together, wire together. Right. Uh, um, well, um, certainly going back to that Grateful Dead concept, we, we, we were all being synchronized in a way by, by rhythm. But one, one can imagine that, um, you know, um, 500,000 years ago, you know, um, uh, and this, this human proclivity, which, which you don't have, you may have in cockatoos, but you, you don't have it in, in chimps, you don't have it in pre-human primates. Um, uh, this, um, one can imagine that sort of singing together, dancing together, doing things together, work songs and, you know, uh, hoeing together. Um, I mean, um, I, I, I think uh, I, I do think that the rhythm is, is very central in, in togetherness. A, a specific example um, which fascinated me was we'll seeing 30 people with Tourette syndrome with sudden ticks and lunges. 
um, um, uh, and also uh, and all in somewhat, somewhat isolated traumatic worlds of their own and out of sync with each other, being brought together in a, in a dance circle and, uh, and they were um, uh, typically someone with Tourette's um, is, um, uh, is focused and unified by performance, whether it's musical performance or, or other things, but I, but, but I think all performance involves rhythm, whether it's athletic performance or sexual performance, musical performance, whatever. Um, so um, I, I, I think rhythm is a, is a great unifier in the nervous system at many levels and, and, and between people. But, um, but I wouldn't call it a theory of everything. <laughs> Almost everything, maybe. Um, yes, at the back. I'm wondering, as a physician, what your recommendation would be for the integration of the nervous system into the body and what would be the implications for the integration of the nervous system into the body and what would be the implications for the integration of the nervous system into the body and what would be the implications for the integration of the nervous system into the body and what would be the implications for the musical therapy into all levels of medical care, neurology, psychiatry, basic clinical care? Um, well, um, the start of formal musical therapy probably came in, in World War I, um, when musicians would sometimes come into these, these wards of the wounded um, to try and bring them some pleasure. But it was also noted then that sometimes uh, you know, pulses would steady and um, uh, blood pressures would come down or come up or whatever, and there would be all sorts of physiological effects. Now, I, for myself, I'm afraid my experience is confined to seeing the power of music um, uh, with neurological and sometimes psychiatric patients and in chronic disease hospitals where basically people are there for, for a long time. Um, uh, I um, but I I think music therapy has been both denied and hyped, uh, but uh, um, there needs to be much more of it, I think, and um, um, it's also cheap in a good way. I said drugs were cheap in a bad way because um, because sometimes it, it can do so much. Um, um, I should say that at the other end of life, I, um, I also think there are strong arguments for introducing music in schools and, and, and early in life, I think. Um, although I don't go with the so-called notes artifact, which has to do with the effect of a little passive listening, I think that active engagement with music, and especially playing with music, can have all sorts of good effects on the brain, and not only the musical parts of the brain, and as fun. So, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm very much more, um, and now we will have an intelligent president, uh, <laughs> and one who values intelligence. I, I, I hope that many aspects of, sort of medicine and education and culture will, you know, including music, will be seen to have found it. Okay, maybe, so two more questions, Prasad? Uh, I'm sorry, the question, uh, relationship between yeah. natural yeah. music, like the babbling of a brook, and, um, and human creative music, so. Um, well, 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 of course, the sounds of nature will have often inspired composers, and you know, babbling brooks are central for, for, for Schubert, or, 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 or the, the Danube, or whatever. Um, uh, a lot of the music, especially in the 17th century, contained sort of imitations of, of bird sounds and so forth. I, um, I, I don't know how much one should extend the word music. I mean, again, of course, you know, metaphorically, people spoke of the music of the spheres, 
and um, uh, and when uh, and the great spectroscopist Arnold Summerfeld once spoke of a photonic beauty of the spheres. Um, and, um, uh, it's said that the I think that the universe, in fact, is is emitting a note which you can't hear because it is 57 octaves below middle C and the wavelength is sort of many light years. Um, but um, uh, um, certainly you see you see rhythm everywhere. You see or you see oscillations. And these have to synchronize and, and, and have some, you know, uh, perhaps you know, light which is sort of braided together of, 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 of electric and magnetic fields is, 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 a, is, a, is a sort of synchronization like that. Um, uh, and now, of course, some pe people talk about string theory, which, which again has a sort of musical. I, I don't know. Um, I'm actually somewhat in dates. Um, I have not ever sort of a very nice book called The Dance of Life, which goes all the way from the atomic to the human. But I accept in a metaphorical, poetic way. I'm, I'm I think, some, somewhat against extending. I think one needs to differentiate human music from natural music, even though the human music may, may contain it. OK, the last question goes to another music professor. Asking about the, the healing power of spiritual music, particularly at funerals, helping people grieve. Um, um, well, first, a, a memory comes to me. I, I, I described it in the book. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was cycling down. I cycled down to the end of Manhattan. I had forgotten that it was 9 11. And um, I started to hear music, and there was a young violinist playing the Bach Chacon, and 200 silent people who were just listening to this, and somehow um, uh, their feelings were flowing out. They were, they were grieving and being consoled at the same time. Uh, the music seemed to somehow mirror their feelings better than any words could have done. Um, the, um, I think amongst the most overwhelming music is certainly um, you know, masses, requiems, and cantatas, um, which um, uh, I'm actually due to next week um, have an F do some functional brain imaging on myself to sort of and see what goes on in the brain when I react emotionally to music and, and play music in my mind. But, but the music I'm selecting is all from Bach's B minor mass. Um, why I should, uh, you know, uh, an, uh, an old Jewish atheist <laughs> should use a Bach B minor mass, I, I don't know. But there you are. It, 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 it gets me immensely powerfully. Um, I, um, but I would think that, um, uh, that one of the primal forms of music, and something one finds in every culture, is, is religious music, ritual music, uh, music for celebration, music for mourning. And um, I think one of the mysterious things is that the, the music, which is, can be infinitely sad in a requiem, can also console at the same time. And, um, and in this way, it's, I think it's like sort of tragedy and, and, um, and Aristotle's catharsis. 
Thank you very much, Oliver. That was wonderful.